uh, that come into play. So let's talk about the uh, issues that are in the news these days, probably more interesting. First of all, the, the so-called travel ban. Um, so what is the law here? The law, the 1952, Congress passed a law called the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, and they specifically gave the president authority to suspend the entry of classes of aliens if the president deems them to be detrimental to the interests of the United States. A clear delegation of power from the Congress, which remember under the Constitution, the Congress has the power to determine immigration laws and policy for the country. This was delegated to the president in 1952. In the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, there were provisions added that said that a president in determining policy like this uh, could not discriminate in any way on the basis of race or gender or nationality, place of birth and place of residence. So, President Trump, after uh, taking office, issued, started issuing executive orders. There were three in all, each one a little bit more narrow uh, and causing a lot of uh, uh, confusion in the application. Uh, the third one, which is narrower, narrower, eliminated some of the confusion and it applied to citizens from Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. And it uh, restricted entry. It actually imposed a, a delay of up to 90 days in approving any kind of entry from for citizens from that country so that those countries so that they could be investigated. But the issue in the cases that evolved, uh, all three of the executive orders were blocked uh, at some stage of the, the process by uh, federal judges. But the issue in the case was whether President Trump's many statements concerning his desire to impose a Muslim ban and only allow Christians into the country uh, indicate that the real reason here was discrimination or a uh, violation of the uh, First Amendment establishment of religion clause. Well, uh, although the executive orders were, were mostly stopped uh, in the lower court, uh, the Supreme Court did rule earlier this year in a five to four decision, very close decision, that the president did have sufficient power to secure the borders as delegated by the Congress, and that there was no uh, discrimination involved. The case is Trump versus Hawaii, so that issue was resolved. It's a much more narrow version than the first one that uh, the president signed back in uh, the early days of his administration. The second issue, uh, border enforcement. Um, the, the wall issue is involved here in the Mexican border. Uh, there's also a lot of additional personnel that have been sent to our southwest border uh, to help protect against unauthorized immigration. There is a 1,933 mile border with the country of Mexico. It includes mountainous territory and includes uh, for long stretches the Rio Grande River. No one can say for sure uh, how many undocumented people cross the border each year. Uh, we don't have an accurate count. They don't stop to tally up along the way. Many come here through the work of smugglers that uh, charge an incredible amount of money to uh, bring people illegally into the United States. Um, you know, we have, we have had uh, periods of time where there have been a lot more people coming across that southwest border than is the case today. Uh, from available numbers uh, from the mid-1980s to the mid-2000s, the government reported apprehending 1 million to 1.6 million foreigners each year who uh, tried to get through the southwestern border. These are the ones who are apprehended. 
Uh, in the year 2000, for example, there was a, they reported between 71,000 and 220,000 were being apprehended each month coming across the border. Uh, known border crossings this year, known border crossings are somewhere between 20,000 and 40,000 a month. But the number of people apprehended or turned away over the years has fallen. The peak was in 2014. 2017, there actually were relatively few compared with the numbers of the past. There was a jump up this year. Uh, in May, for example, there were over 51,000 people who were stopped at the border, but there had only been about 19,000 the year before. Um, I think illegal or undocumented immigration has a lot to do with instability in the Central American countries. Uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, those countries are all uh, relatively uh, instable right now and that has caused a lot of people to leave. Um, you know, if, if you've been here before and been deported, which happens if you commit a serious crime, you're deported, uh, and then you come back, just the act of crossing the border is a felony. It's called illegal reentry of uh, a, an alien who has been deported. And we have quite a few of those cases in our court uh, each year. Uh, but just crossing the border, uh, if you don't have a restriction on your entry into the United States, is, can be uh, classified as a misdemeanor. Talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So let's talk about the wall for a second. We already have a 654-mile mi barrier uh, that imposes a wall of some kind. There's 407 miles of that have a secondary uh, wall as well. The cost of putting a wall along the entire border so difficult to do where the river uh, is the border, but the president says it's a $12 billion cost. That doesn't include, and the administration says it does not include the cost of towers, additional personnel, secondary buildings that will have to be built uh, to uh, handle uh, the flow of people. Um, so the best estimate right now, and it's only an estimate, is that the entire process would probably cost about $33 billion. Um, and that's an estimate because a lot of the area, as I said, is mountainous and it's hard to build walls across mountains and you really can't uh, move the wall to a different area because people then already would be in the United States and that poses problems. So that's where that issue stands. Only planning money uh, has been uh, granted so far for the president. So the third issue I wanted to raise is this policy of separating families at the border, which has been highly controversial. The administration started this relatively early. It was only this last spring that it, it kind of exploded into public view when the Attorney General announced a zero tolerance policy for uh, immigrants who are coming across the border. Again, it's hard to find all of the facts. No one is very clear about the facts kind of a mess. Uh, we know that there are many inter, uh, immediate detention facilities along the border. Uh, people are not supposed to be held there for more than three days before they appear before a judge. Uh, there are longer term uh, detention facilities, uh, which they're only supposed to keep people there for up to 20 days, but that appears to have been routinely violated. That's where unaccompanied children are taken. Uh, part of the problem here is that they have parents who are put into ICE custody. Children are not placed into ICE custody. They're placed into the custody of a different department, the Department of Human Services, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is part of DHS. So that's part of the issue. Uh, in the past, the rules always were that if a family is apprehended at the border or having crossed the border, they're held until their case can be processed. And they were, they were held together. Again, this policy of not separating families. Many are asylum seekers, and they have a right under United States law to have their case processed before 
immigration judges. Uh, some are, in the past, some were held, some families were held, some were allowed into the United States and then they have to appear for court. Some were placed under supervision with ankle bracelets or something. Uh, others were allowed to be in the United States until their case could be processed through an immigration judge to see whether it was true that they had a legitimate fear of persecution and therefore uh, could have a right to be granted asylum by the United States government. So. Uh, if a minor comes by themselves, which happens quite often, uh, they are placed into this resettlement program. There are foster uh, families all across the United States where minors go to. Some minors separated from families have apparently been placed into that program already, uh, even though the family is still either at the border or has been deported. What changed about this policy was that this administration decided to charge people with a, the crime of illegal entry into the United States. That typically hasn't been done in the past. It's simply a misdemeanor. Um, but the decision to charge them then led them to apply the policy, which is always the policy. If you're charged with a crime, you're jailed, but you're not jailed, jailed with your kids. You're separated from your children when you're jailed, uh, when you're charged with a crime. And so that's what they used as a reason to separate the families until this got so much attention. Uh, and there's a big court case in, in uh, Los Angeles that's addressing this that the American Civil Liberties Union has brought. Uh, but they backtracked on that policy this spring. But whether they really have or not is a subject of great debate right now. And no one really knows for sure how far of a backtracking they've done. And there are many children that are still uh, separated by, uh, from their families. There are uh, new uh, sort of, they almost look like little tent cities uh, set up along the border uh, by government contractors who are making quite a bit of money uh, holding either uh, families or children or separated adults as well. So this is just simply a misdemeanor. They go before an immigration judge, and I've seen these proceedings, because sometimes we have to help with these, um, where you can have a thousand people on one day before one judge, and most of them are being sentenced to time served and then deported. Uh, so they really aren't going to, to an American prison for any period of time, but they are convicted. Usually they plead guilty because they don't see any hope of getting into the United States. Those who are seeking asylum do have a right to move that process along, and that is also decided now by immigration judges who are Department of Justice employees. Appeals from those decisions go to the courts of appeals, and so they bypass the district court where, where I work. Uh, sometimes we hear these cases, but only if someone has the wherewithal to file a motion for a writ of habeas corpus, which you can always do in the district court to challenge your detention. So part of the problem is that in, in getting these families back together is that they're in entirely different systems once uh, they uh, come into the United States. The Office of Refugee Resettlement does a fairly good job of placing children with families in the United States, but they're treating them as if they are unaccompanied children when in fact their parents or their father or someone is in a different detention facility that's overseen by the Department of Homeland Security. It is, uh, it's kind of a mess right now. And uh, it's hard to really figure out exactly what's going on. Many are trying to figure that out. Uh, it's being addressed in uh, court. And uh, we'll see where that, that all goes. Uh, the fourth issue I wanted to raise was the issue of amnesty. You know, um, and that includes the Dreamers. I'll talk about that in a moment. But in, we've given am amnesty to undocumented Im immigrants at numbers of times throughout our nation's history. The 1986 Act, which Congress passed and President Reagan signed, uh, was an act that imposed new restrictions, but it also gave amnesty to 2.8 million undocumented workers who are in the United States, and about 150,000 dependents of those workers have now become citizens because of that act. They had to be here for four years, or they had to be working in agriculture. 
You can imagine it's very popular with Hispanic voters, so some politicians are very much in favor of these amnesty programs. The Bush administration even proposed one. They called it a guest worker program that didn't really go too far. Um, so how many are here? Well, um, in 2012, undocumented immigrants made up 3.5 percent of the United States population, about 11 million people. Um, the, in Minnesota, in 2014, we had a little over 100,000 undocumented immigrants living here. They included uh, about 5,500 registered dreamers. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so they were just under 2% of our population in Minnesota in 2014, uh, undocumented immigrants. Um, eight, by the way, 8% of our state's population are immigrants, and half of those people are now citizens. 7% uh, seven per, seven additional 7% are U.S. born, but they have at least one immigrant parent. So we have quite a few immigrants here in Minnesota, in our state. Now the Dreamers, uh, which is a form of amnesty, uh, these are children who are inadmissible and deportable uh, in this country. They're not, many of them aren't children anymore, they're young adults. But they were brought here illegally by parents when they were a child. They've never lived anywhere else, most of them, uh, other than the United States. Uh, they look and act just like any other 17, 18 year old kid or 22 or 23 year old. They sound like us and many of them uh, look like us. So every year since 2001, uh, it's, a bill has been introduced in Congress uh, to provide a path to citizenship for these young people. It's never been passed. It's called the DREAM Act, Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors Act. They're very good at these acronyms in Congress. <laughs> the federal government is good at acronyms. Um, under the provisions of the various laws that have been proposed, they'd have to register, and then they would get conditional status here. There's many requirements that they have to follow, many requirements, but eventually they would get permanent residence and uh, citizenship would be available to them. In 2012, the Obama administration stopped deporting these undocumented immigrants who matched the criteria in the DREAM Act. So the administration took it upon themselves to do what Congress kept proposing every year, and it has passed, passed the House at least twice over the years. Uh, they called it the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program or DACA. There are 740,000 uh, young people who are registered through uh, the first January 1st of this past year. Uh, one year ago, September 5th last year, the Trump administration rescinded the program. So we have all these registered people who now are subject technically to deportation uh, because uh, there's no path for them to uh, become citizens anymore because of the program. It's a subject of legislative debate every year. It's been uh, uh, an issue that has, has reached the, the news virtually weekly ever since the rec rescission of the program, and obviously it means a lot to a lot of young people. Whether something is going to happen, whether the DREAM Act will be part of any of these compromises going forward or not, uh, we don't know. But that is a form of amnesty, and we've done this uh, a number of times over the course of our history. The, the questions here are, is it the moral thing to do for those who are hardworking and they, they have to live in the shadows and worry about whether there's an ICE agent looking into their window? Uh, or is it reward lawlessness? And people have very strong feelings on both sides about this. Uh, finally, I'm going to just spend a couple minutes on sanctuary cities, and then if you have questions or comments, I'd be happy to uh, finish up with that. So, sanctuary cities, uh, you've heard a lot about that. It's not really like a sanctuary. It's not, uh, it's not like there are hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants in an auditorium someplace with vigilantes guarding the door to make sure that 
uh, the uh, ICE agents can't come in. It's not like that. It's basically cities that have agreed to limit their cooperation with the federal government uh, and the federal government's efforts to enforce immigration law. It's not a shielding, it's not a sanctuary in the traditional sense, it's just cities, and California, I think it applies in the entire state, uh, that uh, will limit their cooperation. So, in a sanctuary, let's, let's play out what happens. When a person is arrested, say they had a broken taillight and they don't have a driver's license, or there is an open bottle in the car, or something. Uh, in a sanctuary city, what usually happens is there's no notification to ICE that this person is not a citizen. It's usually obvious when you're arrested and you don't have uh, necessary papers that you're not a citizen, but they don't notify ICE. Uh, when they're cleared of charges, plead guilty, get a sentence, post bail, whatever, um, they're released. Nothing more happens. In a non-sanctuary city, usually what will happen, and not all the time, it depends on local officials what they want to do, they might notify ICE that they have someone in their custody, and ICE will then place a detainer on them so they can't be released. So ICE detainers keep a lot of people in jail, uh, but it's an official document and it's legal and they can, if someone is an undocumented immigrant and they're arrested, ICE finds out about it, then uh, their, uh, their, the detainer is placed. There's always a detainer and there's a notification process that goes on everywhere if the person arrested is someone who's been deported from the country in the past for having committed a crime. We have illegal reentry cases, we probably have about 40 to 45 a year in my court. Uh, so that, there's an automatic notification then. But these minor crimes in non-sanctuary cities, or in sanctuary cities, uh, ICE does not receive notice. The problem here is if there is a gap, if the person is arrested, maybe they shouldn't have been arrested, maybe it's such a minor crime they shouldn't have been arrested, but if there's a gap between their being processed out and when ICE issues its detainer, you've got a period of time where technically a constitutional violation has occurred. A violation of the Fourth Amendment, someone being held without any kind of reasonable suspicion or probable cause. That's where a lot of these cases are coming from. I have a number on my docket right now, uh, one uh, fairly major one that's in Anoka County. Um, in Minnesota, only Minneapolis has a, an ordinance uh, proclaiming uh, itself as a sanctuary city. I'm not aware of any others. It's not a bar on cooperation, it's simply limited cooperation. And local officials, uh, particularly like the Hennepin County Sheriff, gets pressure all the time from ICE to cooperate, and I don't think there's been a full cooperation yet. The administration has uh, uh, threatened economic reprisals to these areas, but nothing has happened yet. Um, so, the issue keeps coming up of whether local law enforcement can stop people to uh, check their immigration status. They were routinely doing that in Arizona a while back and got the sheriff, Sheriff Joe, whatever his name is, in big trouble. And he actually got uh, a prison term before he was pardoned over uh, basically his actions in front of the court when this policy was challenged. Under the Fourth Amendment, everyone has a right to the protection of the United States Constitution, even if you're an undocumented immigrant. It applies to you if you're in the United States. And so, you have to have reasonable suspicion of a violation of law before you can stop someone. And therefore, simply stopping someone on the street to check out whether they're uh, an illegal immigrant or not um, really falls afoul of the Fourth Amendment. The law is confusing in this area, it's developing significantly, and ultimately I suppose the Supreme Court will tell us just how far local law enforcement can go, uh, but it's a bit of a tussle right now between local authorities and cities and the federal government, which of course wants all the help that uh, they can get. So. That's the sanctuary cities issue. I think I'm getting close to the end of my time, uh, and you don't want to go over the time with the pastor sitting close to the front row. <laughs> but, uh, 
but, <laughs> but I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, if you have comments, that'd be fine too. Jerry, back here. Oh, there's one. That's a good question. The, you know, actually nothing uh, in uh, ICE agents can do that. And if they catch someone who is an undocumented immigrant, they can bring the proceedings before an immigration judge. Can't just deport them on your own. It has to be a judicial proceeding. But they can, they can arrest them and bring them before an immigration judge and usually they're going to be deported. Uh, the question arises as to what local law enforcement can or should be doing about that. That's, that's more of a constitutional issue. Local law enforcement has authority uh, to arrest people if they've observed a crime or if they have a reasonable suspicion of a crime. If someone looks like they're from another country and speaks Spanish, for example, that's not reasonable suspicion of someone being here illegally. So that's where all the issues are. But ICE does have the authority to check documents and to uh, move to have people deported. But if they have no documents, and there's no way to just turn around and say, go back to Well, a lot, of, a lot of them get very, um, very adept at figuring out. A lot of them get fake documents. Smugglers provide that. Sometimes it's very, very difficult. If they don't have documents with them, like I don't have my birth certificate with me. So I don't, don't carry it with me. Uh, I have a driver's license that shows I, I, I live in Minnesota. But, you know, immigrants who are not in, uh, only 12 states allow uh, immigrants to have driver's licenses even. But if you have one, you know, that's some evidence of citizenship. So it's, it's a very difficult, difficult task. But ICE officials are the ones that do have the authority and the extent to which locals can do it is a much tougher issue because of the Constitution. But they get, they get court Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are. If, the, if, if they, unless they, you know, some of them will, it's a court proceeding, they'll plead guilty to illegally crossing the border and then they're deported right away. I mean, they don't have an adjudication then, they just plead guilty. And a lot of them do that because they see no hope of getting in. But uh, a legitimate request for asylum uh, then we'll get you uh, a judicial proceeding before an immigration judge. And then you have to prove you have a fear of persecution, of course. All right, Mike? No, I didn't have anything. And in, um, you mentioned that in 1952, mm -hmm. the president was given the power right. to um, decide which countries the people could come in from. Was there some event in history at that time that brought this about, this change? I think it was a reaction to um, probably the years running up to World War II uh, and Congress was not able to pass laws quickly enough to address some of the immigration issues that occurred in the 1930s. The, the Jewish populations in Europe and Eastern Europe who were trying to get into the United States, they had no authority to do so, and the administration then they refused to allow it. Um, and Congress really couldn't act fast enough. And then I think the post-World War II, where a lot of people came in who were refugees from the, the crisis, the war-torn areas of the world, 
uh, they just felt that it was better to have the Immigration and Naturalization Service and Border Patrol and the law enforcement agencies at the time work underneath the president to make these determinations so they could do it faster. I think that was the reason. Plus, it was a deeply politicized issue in Congress as well. So now that the um, people crossing the border, whether they're asylum seekers or not, are charged with the misdemeanor crime and they have to do that court process first, how does the being found guilty of that misdemeanor affect their asylum process, if at all? Well, if they, if they claim that they are here seeking asylum, they, they are put into uh, that process, the asylum process. It's unclear whether those people are being held or released and allowed into the United States right now. Typically in the past we've allowed them in and then they've gotten a court date. Uh, but a lot, of them, a lot of people coming across the border really don't know what their rights are. They're fleeing a horrible situation at home. A lot of them are trying to avoid being killed actually by the, you know, the gang warfare and uh, the government instability of Central America, and they don't really know their rights. And that, you know, there are lawyers there at the border who are trying to help, but it's a messy situation because there's a lot of people there. When you think about even 20 or 25,000 people coming in a month, that's hard to handle. Uh, so usually they're allowed to go into the asylum process, and the question of whether they're being held or released is one that's not really clear right now to most. Yes, the uh, so-called dreamers, mm -hmm. assuming they have a job here, are they paying taxes? Uh, do they get health benefits? Can they get a driver's license? Well, under, we, we don't have a dreamers program right now, but those 550, 570,000 or so that did register, there was a set of things that they had to do. They had to be working or be a student, um, they had to uh, not commit a crime. Uh, they were eligible for benefits to a certain extent, probably not the extent that someone who's a citizen is, but they had a certain level of rights. But it's really a path toward, after a period of time, uh, being given a green card and permanent residency, which you have to have in order to then apply for citizenship. Um, but now the system is not in place anymore. There's, they're registered, but they're not really having to follow any rules, so I'm not really sure what's happening, and I don't think anyone really knows what's happening with them. Thank you so much. This right. was uh, incredible. I want to say that we will continue the immigration um, conversation on September 30th when we have Manuel Bajorquez from CBS News, who is an immigrant himself and uh, covers the border and many other things. And hope you can join us next week where we'll have uh, Paul Douglas and Jordana Green here and we'll talk about their work and how they keep uh, faith as a part of their day. Thank you.